Good morning. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are taking some time this morning to uh, to open up and allow uh, any folks who would like to put an idea on the table to come and present them to us. And uh, the next person we have presenting is our one and only Representative Higley. Um, so, Mark, I'm sorry that you were called away to a different uh, committee that earlier this morning. Um, these these um, segments have been going pretty smoothly in terms of people being able to present, ask clarifying questions during the presentation, and then leave 10 minutes at the end for, uh, for any other Q&A. So take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I'm sorry uh, if I would have known I was third in line over in general housing in regards to uh, the contractor bill. So, uh, but it was interesting as well to, to hear the other uh, two amendments. So I appreciate uh, being allowed to, to be uh, absent. Uh, I can catch up, I'm sure. I believe it was on Representative Beck and Cynthia Browning's testimony. Is that correct? Yes, and uh, Amy Town, president of the SCA, also presented a proposal. Oh, good. All right, well, yeah, I'm sure I can zoom back and, and or, uh, look at that. Uh, I'm sure uh, what I have to say won't take a lot of time. I, I did actually look over um, Representative Lefebvre's and, and the uh, three amigos uh, that uh, proposed uh, a plan as well. Um, so I just wanna start, I guess, by saying some of what I said yesterday in regards to, um, I wanna make sure that going forward, this, uh, this new plan, whatever it might be is, is something that, that can be sustainable and, and can be uh, uh, good for both uh, uh, the employer, us, and the employee. Uh, so in that regards, um, I, I guess I'd, I'd first just like to start out with um, the uh, pension uh, potential options that uh, Chris Rupert put out on the 23rd of March, uh, where it talks about you know, some of the options. And one of the options is to create a defined contribution plan with employer matches, uh, hybrid plans with features of both the DB and the DC plans. Uh, to what extent should new hires have the option of choosing which plan? Uh, incentives versus mandates. Um, typically new plans are created for new hires with the goal of reducing the risk of growing retirement liabilities in future. That's what I'm talking about. Um, have more plan options, may appeal to different segments of the workforce. I've heard that time and time again by uh, different people that have uh, reached out to me. Um, not every public employee has long-term career outlook. Uh, employees with higher expectations of career and mobility, portability may be desire a more portable retirement savings vehicle. Um, governments have increasingly adopted new plans for new hires, but a uh, few have abandoned the, the DP model entirely. Um, and uh, putting all new hires into a DC plan will not solve the existing structural issues in the legacy uh, DB plan. Um, I, I completely understand that. I, again, I've, I've been talking with the Reason Foundation. They put out a 48 page um, slide show for me. I, I didn't ask whether or not I could uh, present that, but I, I kind of perused it myself. Um, it really um, lays out uh, guidelines for uh, the ability to have a hybrid or bifurcated system, has worked in other states. Um, I even mentioned, uh, you may have uh, um, remember that when Treasurer Pierce was in, I asked her about the DC plan and she had real concerns in regards to uh, it seems like in her experience, a lot of folks end up with not much of a retirement at the end of that. Um, but these people tell me that all depends on uh, which, what you put together for a new, new plan. Um, and again, uh, one of their uh, comments in moving forward um, that they had kind of three priorities, pay down the debt as fast as you can, and looking at all different kinds of options. Um, number two, get your assumptions right. That's, of course, a difficult one. Uh, and number three, build a plan for the future, sustainable for the state and for the employees. Um, so then if I can, I'll, I'll just go to, um, I believe it came, there's been so much information out there, but I jotted down some information from, I believe, what the Vermont Business Roundtable had, had uh, entered. And 
in talking about South Dakota in particular. Um, similar size state, 760,000 population. Uh, their GDP per capita is similar, uh, 52,913 to 48,855. Um, uh, state employees, similar, uh, again, um, um, it looks like 19,000 to 14,006. This was information in, in that report, I believe. Um, but I'll just read a little bit of that. So it says the South Dakota retirement system defined benefit and contributions are essential for an equitable distribution of benefits to both career and non-career members. Pension members in the state pay equal fixed statutory contribution rates, equal mem member contributions ensure a shared responsibility for overall management of the plan. Um, the South Dakota plan uh, was looking at a 55% final average of compensation, um, and it should increase that to the overall 85% with uh, Social, Security, Social Security benefits being added. Um, their, their plans have been 100% funded in the uh, past 22 of 27 actuarial uh, evaluations. Um, and then just another note, fixed track contribution rates by statute prevent the transfer of costs from current generations of working uh, employees to future uh, generations. Um, and uh, just last night, I received a email from an individual who'd moved to Vermont from uh, Indiana and uh, in, in his email, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read it. Uh, I tuned in the other day for your meeting uh, with uh, Treasurer Pierce. You brought up using a hybrid plan and we're basically told it just doesn't work. I moved here last year from Indiana and they have a hybrid plan and a DC only plan. Some people can choose between the two and others are only enrolled in the DC plan depending on the municipality. As far as I know, I'm not aware of the program being in any danger of being underfunded. Uh, just thought I would share this information and he's got a link to uh, that uh, state's uh, uh, pension uh, plan and proposal. So um, I guess uh, with that, um, oh, the other, the other thing that um, I, would, I would like to say is I would certainly appreciate hearing more from uh, uh, Jim, Voitko, I believe is the last name, but he's the from RVK, the general consultant to VPIC. Uh, boy, he, he seemed uh, very knowledgeable and I, and I certainly had some more questions for him. So I hope going forward, we can, we can get him back. Um, another concern that I have and, and not really knowing the answer yet is in age 315, um, you might have seen that there's still a there's still an amount of money in there of twenty million dollars for funding OPEB. Um, we were told during the budget that uh, appropriations that included, I believe, that twenty million dollars in the one hundred and fifty million dollar OPEB figure. I've reached out a number of times to get the answer as to well whether this is an additional twenty million dollars, and uh, haven't received that answer yet. So I think that's important for us to understand going forward, is there going to be an additional $20 million uh, to, to help out with OPEB or is that included in that 150? Um, and I guess that kind of gets me to my final point. Again, in H315, uh, uh, along in that section, I can't remember just which section it is, maybe 20, um, it talks about that uh, where the administration, the legislature, and the treasurer will work together to create a proposal by May 30th, 2021. I don't believe that, and I said it all along, um, I don't believe that's a realistic goal. Um, and I've, I've seen, uh, like I said, a couple of the other proposals, I actually read uh, uh, previous Representative Browning's proposal, uh, talked a little bit with Representative Beck. Um, there's a lot out there. There's, there's a lot out there. Um, and so I guess in my, my final comments would be that, and, I, and I've said it kind of consistently that I'm, I'm open to um, 
extending this process, whatever you might call it. Uh, I, I don't know as though I would call it a summer study committee, but I would call it a, a working group starting immediately with uh, all the stakeholders involved and um, coming back with a proposal by let's say the end of this fiscal year. Um, so uh, again, that's, that's the position I'm taking right now uh, because of uh, all the information that's out there that still hasn't really been um, talked about or work, worked with uh, all the stakeholders. And, and I think there's some uh, smart cookies out there and uh, uh, we can come up with uh, something that works into the future, I believe, but uh, it's gonna take longer than uh, uh, May 30th. So with that, mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, I again appreciate uh, you giving us the opportunity to at least uh, lay out some of our concerns and, and options and, and we'll go from there. Thanks, Mark. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate uh, seeing the link that you talked about to the other retirement plan. Um, and I don't know about the three amigos thing. Uh, <laughs> One of the problems that we have in our defined contribution plans that we have in the state now is that people out of either caution or fear elect uh, far too often to go into really low return uh, instruments, some even to the uh, uh, stable value fund, which is basically an enhanced savings account. Uh, in any of your investigation, have you found uh, any tool that other systems use to get people to the point where they realize they're saving for 30 years worth of future and need to be a little more aggressive. That's a problem that seems to be a, a big plague. Right, well, the only thing I can say to that is, uh, and I, again, I can't remember just who, if it, who it was, if it was somebody from the round table or not, but uh, I had asked about that and, and they talked about how uh, these employees aren't going to go go it on their own. Uh, granted, I mean, that's their option, but uh, they talk about a sponsor. They talk about trustees. Um, so uh, to me, um, you know, it's, it's to, the, there's that option to have that help to, to help them create what's needed uh, for when they retire. Thank you. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Mark. I am in agreement with you that we need, we definitely need more time. I did um, have a question about South Dakota. So I know that John Pelletier also testified that that's 100% funded, but I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's currently 92% funded. Um, but I also wonder what is the average benefit that comes out of that plan? Did you look into what that's paying out and what people are actually getting? Um, I don't have that right in front of me. I do have that um, on my computer somewhere, but. Uh, yeah, Tanya, I don't, I don't have that right in front of me. Okay. I know that I know they were talking about. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So yeah, I don't, I don't have that in front of me. All right, thank you, Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mark, for um, giving us another uh, avenue to explore. I continue to um, puzzle over how, what the trajectory and what the path to unwind the legacy plan, uh, as you may know, that has come up a couple of times this morning. I don't want to drag you into other conversations, but when you offer an alternative, whether it's for new hires or in parallel to the exist, existing uh, defined benefit plan, uh, invariably there uh, is both an unwinding of the legacy plan, if the idea is to terminate that, as well as, if you will, growing and um, supporting uh, the alternative, unless it's a 100% employee contributor, which, which I understand uh, would be, in quotes, easy on the state. I'm opposed to that, uh, but I understand that's a way to get around this problem. And I, I'm, I'm not clear, nobody, has actually said to me, here's uh, the glide path. Um, uh, our colleague, uh, Rep Hooper, uh, typified this as a, as a, a, a curve, which is uh, like an upside down parabola. That is to say, it goes down for a time, 
but then when you get near the end, it probably has a fairly steep slope uh, as you're, if you like, fighting a shrinking fund and the last, let's say, thousand people who are moving into um, terminating their retirement payments. That's a real squeeze and, and nobody, um, uh, nobody satisfied me. That's, that's a situation I want to cope with. But thank you anyway for throwing the idea out again. Thank you, and uh, I did find some information uh, for Tanya. Uh, so the average pay for state employees in 2019 was $55,900. So what I had said originally talking about uh, their 55% uh, of final average compensation should increase by 85%. So I'm assuming, you know, that would, that would be around uh, 20, well, 50% of that is, what, 26, 7, 27, 50, 27,500. Um, so more than that. So uh, I don't have my calculator right in front of me, but anyway, that's 50% is easy enough to calculate. But uh, so it looks like um, 28,000 um, plus talking about uh, once they reach uh, uh, Social Security age, uh, that would bump that up to 85% of, of their final average compensation. Great, thanks. I can, I'm sure I can find the exact numbers too. I was just wondering if you had them handy, but thank you for doing that math for me. Yeah. Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Representative. Morning, morning. Um, you know, I'm gonna probably be accused a little bit of asking a question and I have an idea of what the answer is, but we've kicked around this thing about the defined contribution um, a fair amount as is it's something that is very unique and not done currently, but aren't there several examples where within state government that it already is a option? It's my understanding that in the executive branch, the exempt employees have that as an option. And a plan that we haven't talked about, and I really don't know the answer to this one is, is the, the municipal pension. Um, it is my, I've heard that is it an option for them, but I don't know that to be the case. And then haven't you made the comment in the past that your wife was part of one of those plans in the state college system as well? Correct. Uh, I know uh, about the state college system, which is, you know, the TIAA uh, defined contribution plan. Um, I'm not sure. I just heard yesterday myself, as a matter of fact, of uh, Veemers uh, having a, a defined contribution uh, piece, I guess. Uh, so, so yeah, that would be uh, very interesting to uh, take testimony on uh, just just what those plans are like, how people are faring in them, uh, if they like them, if, if how many people are involved in it. Um, sure, I, I I would certainly uh, appreciate that knowledge. Thank you. Nice job, sir. All right. Any other questions for Mark? All right, thank you, Mark. I appreciate yeah. you um, preparing some thoughts to share with us and posing some questions for possible future study. Thank you. All right, so we are a little ahead of schedule, which is nice, and we do have our next uh, witness with us. So um, Sam Lefebvre has, uh, has reserved some time here this morning um, to put some ideas on the table. Um, and uh, for the purposes of this discussion, we are, um, we are opening up time for people to present uh, their new ideas um, and uh, including, as we've seen a, a few folks previously, uh, leave us with questions that we might wanna investigate further. Um, so new ideas on the table, Sam Lefebvre, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I apologize, I have to do this on my cell phone because I do not have internet access. Um, so I apologize, I'll hold my phone. Um, but good morning and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present PMTK, which proposes a framework for a sustainable path forward. I believe that plan participants should have options and should know that they can and should be the ultimate stakeholder for their people. 
Throughout the hours of testimony that I have heard and read, I found that one of the biggest disappointments is that participants do not have a choice. They must pay into the system, which they have rightfully done, but the goalposts keep moving. We are here to offer options and opportunity to those who deserve them. To us, promises made should be promises kept, and that is what you will see in the opening of this proposal. We begin with underlying the notion that no one who is retired will be affected. With B, we move to the implementation of the soft freeze. A soft freeze would allow current participants to stay in the current DB plan with no changes. The plan would close to all hired after the freeze date. Promises made are promises kept for all current participants. The other option that is listed right below is 1A. This type of soft freeze affords participants all of the accrued benefits to date of the freeze. Benefits would increase with growth in the participants' wages. I am much more partial to the first soft freeze as I feel is doing the right thing by leaving current members alone while giving them the opportunity to move if they so choose. However, all promises made will be kept to the date of the freeze with no other changes. Section C will outline the creation of options with a concurrent defined contribution plan. Please understand that this is not to replace the current defined benefit plan, but rather a concurrent plan to run along with the DB until the last member leaves the plan. The proposal would offer a 4.5% match from the state. A mutual fund company would be selected and responsible for the implementation of the new plan. This company would be responsible for all the future record keeping and producing the reports for the plan participants. This would be a significant savings for the state. While I mentioned earlier that all current participants could choose to remain in the current DB plan, early calculated present value of their DB plan to the new DC plan. This again will help lower the unfunded liability significantly. Another, um, another option within the new DC plan is an annuity. Regardless of what your experience level is with investing, this option would allow any new, I apologize, um, plan participants or members transferring from the DB plan to create essentially a personalized DB plan with a guaranteed lifetime payout. Investment choices would also include a diversified selection of mutual funds and an option for age appropriate safe harbor investments. Examples of these are target gate funds, a better way to think of a safe harbor is to think of an age appropriate portfolio that is on cruise control and will adjust as your birthdays pass. This is crucial because the current time everyone is being invested together. I should not, with all due respect, be in the same bracket as Representative Anthony. We do not believe that individual brokerage accounts should be allowed. Bill Huff will now review and explain the benefits to all stakeholders. Uh, Madam Chair and Representatives, Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to testify today about PMPK. Uh, our framework for a path forward to a sustainable Vermont pension system. But briefly, I'm a former certified financial planner who has studied, designed, and sold a number of different retirement plans. I am also a retired pilot for Transworld Airlines and American Airlines, both of whom went bankrupt and terminated defined benefit plans where I was a participant. We feel like there are significant benefits to our proposal for all stakeholders, the state, taxpayers, and of course, most importantly, pension plan participants. Benefits for the state and taxpayers would include the following. Actuaries deal with a multitude of variables and defined benefit plans. Choosing the plan or closing the plan to new hires will begin to eliminate, that's the soft freeze that Samantha uh, suggested, closing that plan to the to new hires will begin to eliminate some of those variables by lowering the number and age ranges of remaining participants. The fewer variables should allow for greater accuracy in actuarial estimates. Fewer participants will mean lower ADEX and a shrinking unfunded liability over time, eventually disappearing entirely when the de defined benefit plan eventually terminates with the death of the last participant. Our provision to allow a defined benefit 
plan participant to exchange their present value of their actuarially determined benefit into the new DC plan, the defined contribution plan, would significantly and instantly reduce the unfunded liability. Understand that that unfunded liability is an actuarially determined figure that will no longer exist when the participant leaves the defined benefit plan. Depending upon uh, a number of factors, uh, the reduction in unfunded liability will be significantly higher than the transferred amount from DB plan to DC plan and could potentially reduce the unfunded liability by billions within a few short years. PMPK would pay all accrued promised benefits to date with none of the committee's currently proposed changes. The state will have kept their promise. Annual budgetary needs are gradually reduced with a sustainable and predictable plan match replacing the ADEC over time. Taxpayers would see relief as plan costs and a rising, rising credit rating would save the state money. The current periodic contentious negotiations over plan, uh, plan provisions with participants would virtually be eliminated. But most importantly, uh, plan participants would benefit from PMPK as follows. Most participants will feel as though promises made have been promises kept. Participants will have a degree of control over future benefits as they alone, and as much as the law would allow, determine contributions, asset allocation, and risk tolerance specific to their goals and needs. The opportunity would exist to fully fund a retirement benefit rather than just the 50 to 60% of average final compensation now allowed in the current defined benefit plan. Account balances at retirement would be the sole property of the plan participant. Payout amounts and frequency are at the discretion of the retiree, allowing for maximum financial flexibility. Participants will have a wide range of choices for investment and can tailor a portfolio to meet needs and goals. But we also recognize some new participants excluded from the defined benefit plan would still desire the attributes of a DB plan. Therefore, PMPK would offer an investment option as an investment option, an annuity with payout options and guarantees that mimic everything that is currently available in the DB plan. We also recognize some plan participants may not know or want to manage their own investments. Therefore, PMPK would offer safe harbor investments that Sam mentioned. They automatically provide a large diversified portfolio appropriate to the age and the estimated retirement date of the participant that automatically adjust as one ages. The so-called target date funds can actually continue on in retirement to prudently pay out a lifetime income. Because the defined contribution plan participants own the full account value and not just the promised benefit, they can create a family financial legacy by listing beneficiaries beyond that of the typical participant and spouse or partner an important provision not currently available. The combination of participant contributions, the state match, and a prudent investment mix should easily be able to uh, accumulate assets sufficient to pay out a lifetime income with periodic inflation adjustments that equates or betters the current defined benefit plan. And finally, the current periodic contentious negotiations uh, over plan provisions with legislators and the treasury would virtually be eliminated. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much for coming with a presentation and some ideas um, and also for leaving us ample time for questions. So committee members. Bob Hooper. <clears throat> Unmute myself. Bill, thank you. And Samantha, thank you. Um, Bill, you painted a rosy picture there. And part of that rosy picture is not so rosy. Can you tell us what would have happened to the individual that retired 
from a career with this uh, defined contribution plan if they retired in December of 2010? Well, it's impossible to speculate uh, uh, what that individual may have done with their particular investments. But what we did in this framework is to offer opportunities for somebody that could actually duplicate everything that they have in the defined benefit plan now. So, for instance, uh, the individual that you're referring to uh, uh, that retired in 2010, if they had opted uh, for an annuity option within the defined contribution plan, uh, their, their payout could be guaranteed uh, just like uh, is currently available in the defined benefit plan. I, you know, I understand, uh, Representative Hooper, what you're alluding to. Uh, you know, the markets took big dips in, in or a big dip in uh, 2008, uh, started to recover by 9 and 10. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the account value will, will, will vary with, with markets and depending on how that particular participant uh, chooses to invest their investments will dictate what that final outcome is, uh, but I can also say that if an individual is um, working with a, a financial planner or, or is astute enough on their own to understand markets, markets recovered. And if they'd have stuck with uh, uh, whatever investment that they had at that, that point, they would be probably about what 125, 150 percent ahead of where they were when they retired. It might have been tough for a year or two, but uh, the markets uh, did eventually recover. My point is that I think in all these conversations, we need to recognize that there's an up and a down, and that needs to be on the table. And and you're 100 percent right. And going into an annuity once you have the cash is an available option. However, that in and of itself has cost. Thank you. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, good morning, Bill. Thank you for being here. And uh, very nice job, Amanda. I mean, Samantha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, a question I have is we've had several people testify that the current plan, one of the recommendations is that we do an actuarial deep dive analysis every three years now versus every five, which to me, I'm just, I'm, I'm surprised at that. Um, so my question is, is what would you recommend? How, what kind of a time frame should somebody look back over for prior time period as far as plans, earnings, um, or growth? And when would be an appropriate time to I guess, strategize and reprioritize and maybe change your plan going forward. Uh, uh, thank you, Representative LeClaire, for the question. Uh, in my, my personal opinion, uh, as a certified financial planner and years in the business managing money, the difference between a, a three-year and a five-year look back, I don't think has uh, a tremendous amount of difference. Uh, anytime you're dealing with financial markets, uh, you need to look over uh, the longer time frame, frame the better. And so I, I really don't see uh, uh, that changing from a five year uh, look back to a three year is, is going to be all that beneficial. Uh, the, well, in my, if I may continue, the, uh, uh, the, the current plan is, is just uh, unsustainable. And I, and I would hope that everybody would agree with that and, and something needs to be done. Uh, so the proposal that, that Samantha and I have put together would eventually take care of uh, the defined benefit plan, just close it to new participants. But if they want to stay there, they can, so that they, uh, if, if, they if they like that style of, of pension, that, that's fine but then uh, start a concurrent and parallel defined contribution plan with many of the same attributes as the defined benefit plan, but, but at a much, much cheaper cost of the state. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, can I ask one more question, Madam Chair? 
Um, so that prompts. So, I mean, as, as if, if you're working with a client and you're looking back over their portfolio and it hasn't met your or their projected expectations of growth or dividends, um, how long of a time frame do you look back over before you make a, a, a change in that plan going forward to reflect those desired goals? Well, typically, uh, financial professionals uh, try to meet with clients on a quarterly basis uh, uh, to review the, the, the plan. And uh, what you're suggesting, I, th I think, is more of a, an asset allocation question. If, if um, you want to compare what the portfolio is for that particular client with what's going on in the marketplace, and if you're not uh, meeting the averages that you should in the market, then it's probably a question of uh, asset allocation more than anything else. Uh, asset allocation, you know, those, those models can vary all over the place. Personally, uh, I, I'm a big fan of the, the equity markets, and I've been retired now from both the airline and the certified financial planner business for, for about six years uh, I've never changed my asset allocation. Uh, I, I know what I want and I stick with it. And, uh, and I think if more people were to, to take that lesser plan of action, uh, they'd probably be better off. Uh, the tendency is for a lot of people, if they look too frequently, is to begin to chase returns. And that's, uh, that's counterproductive. Uh, and that, I, that I, I see a lot. Uh, you meet with a client and, well, gee whiz, my neighbor's doing better than I am, or I'm not doing to the market. So, you know, the, the representative uh, planner is for, kind of uh, forced into, you know, making changes, but, but those gains in that particular market have, have come and gone. Uh, so it's, it's counterproductive to actually look at it too often. Very good. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Mark Higley. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I, I just noticed in my notes too, um, it, and I believe it, it was from Chris Roop from JFO, uh, talking about that uh, any hybrid plan would have to be looked at by an actuary or have an actuarial analysis. Uh, what would what would that actually look like? What do you, and and what what length of time would there be for that consideration? Yeah, the, uh, the PMPK doesn't do away with a defined benefit plan, so that's still going to be there. You're still going to need actuaries as long as that, that plan is in place. Uh, but by closing it to, to new members, it would eventually end uh, when that last uh, DB plan participant were to die. So it, we're looking at a, at a, a very long time frame that, that you would still have that. Uh, DB plan in existence, and, and you're going to need actuaries just like you do now. But as the plan shrinks, as the number of participants shrink, and the uh, uh, variance in ages begins to decline as that pool of people that are left ages, the job of the actuary becomes uh, much, much easier uh, because the, you've eliminated a lot of the variables. So yes, you are gonna need the actuary. You're, you're gonna have that cost of a concurrent uh, uh, defined contribution plan. But my suggestion would be to take the $150 million that's been uh, alluded to here as a, a possible addition to the current defined benefit plan, which I look at as a Band-Aid. If it's gonna take some money in it, and it would to transition to a hybrid plan like, like we're talking about, use that money that is available to you to make the, the changes now to a sustainable plan for the future. And I think the, what Sam and I have presented is the framework to be able to do that. Uh, to, uh, you know, the, the $150 million added uh, or to pay down some unfunded liability is a great grand gesture but in the long run, it, it won't solve the issues that we're looking at here. So I, I guess if I could follow up, Bill, uh, it, my question maybe was a little bit different than that, that any hybrid plan, whether it's yours or, or something uh, other groups uh, present, um, 
has to have an actuarial analysis prior to consideration, my understanding. And, and I guess how long would something like that that take if, if a proposal, well, even your proposal, let's say, uh, it appears to me that JFO was saying that there'd have to be an analysis of that um, hybrid plan. Does, does that make sense? All right. I, yeah, I think I understand what your question is. And, and I think the answer is, is relatively simple. If you were to start from scratch and, and develop a hybrid plan, Part of that plan then is a defined benefit plan and absolutely you're gonna need actuaries and that's gonna take some time for those people to, to make their calculations and estimates. But what we're proposing is we already have a defined benefit plan. We already have those actuaries and they're familiar with that part of the plan. But by adding a defined contribution plan, there are no uh, actuaries involved with that. So uh, Representative Higley, to answer your question, I'd, I don't think it would take any any longer to do any analysis than is currently uh, they they have with uh, our current DB plan. That that's not going to change, and we're not adding a new defined benefit plan that would uh, complicate their calculations. So uh, it would be relatively easy, I would expect. Thank you. Welcome, John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Samantha and Bill, for testifying this morning. Um, I have two questions. Um, my fir first question deals with some data I was looking at out of the 2019 Survey of Consumer Finances, which is put out by the Federal Reserve. Um, it indicates that the average retirement savings for a household, and I emphasize the word household, is about $165,000 for retirement. How much of a, an annual annuity would that purchase? Uh, I've been to, uh, as a certified financial planner, I've been to a number of national conventions and they've, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to uh, sit in on seminars from some of the nationally renowned experts in that particular field, because it's always a, uh, a, a tough question knowing how much you can derive from uh, a pool of money. Uh, the short answer is, uh, if you listen to the, the, the experts in this field, it's about 4%. Uh, so what is it? It's, uh, it's, it's not a lot of money if your pool that you're working from is, uh, is only $165,000. Uh, but the calculations that I have made uh, with a financial function calculator, I, I took a hypothetical uh, individual that might work for the state, it, it really doesn't matter, 20 or 30 years, and said that that individual would contribute 7%, the state, 4.5%, uh, and, and uh, you'd make 7% on your money, which is the, the same amount that the, the treasurer is using now. And the figure that I could come out with, whether, and it didn't make any difference, it was a 20 or 30 year period, I could match exactly what the benefit is from the defined benefit plan now with a 4% withdrawal, which uh, includes adjusting for inflation over time. But that assumes that everybody maximizes their contributions. Um, I, I estimated contributions at 7%. And the reason that our plan was four and a half was that what was what I needed to equate to what the defined benefit plan produces now. Uh, and I understand that uh, as our plan was introduced to several people, that was one of the questions uh, because right now in the defined contribution plans that the state already operates, the state contribution is 7%. But it really doesn't make any difference if, uh, if I say the, the participant puts in seven and a half and the state four and a half, the total's uh, 12%. So just re reverse them, and the number is going to work out the same. The participant could put in four and a half, the state seven and a half. You still got the twelve percent monthly contributions. Uh, that over a period of time at seven percent, which is the number that our own treasury uses, you can equate a, a, a lifetime income uh, inflation adjusted that equates to the defined benefit plan now. Which means if the uh, participant were to contribute any more than that. Uh, and uh, DC plans allow even for some pretty substantial contributions in later years to call makeup provisions. 
uh, which I took advantage of in my my final years of work, you can you can uh, boost that that lump of of money considerably, and you would probably uh, likely come up with a, uh, a benefit that is exceeds what is available from the defined benefit plan now. Unfortunately, the, the data from the survey of consumer finance would not bear that out. Um, my, my second question um, deals with, hold on, I have to pull up the document. Um, the, the Michigan, Michigan closed its defined benefit plan in 1997. Um, the plan was actually overfunded. It had 190, 109% of assets on hand to cover all liabilities. Um, by 2012, 15 years after freezing new hires out, the plan had become severely underfunded with an underfund, unfunded level of just 60%. In other words, while the plan had excess assets on hand um, in 1997, by 2012, the plan amassed a significant unfunded liability of 6.2 billion. Couldn't that happen with this plan that you proposed? Uh, I'm not familiar with what happened in Michigan, but I would speculate that the uh... Uh, once the plan was was closed, and because it was overfunded to begin with, that somebody, perhaps the legislature along the line, thought uh, maybe we can we don't have to put in as much as we were before, and and that's not the case. Uh, you're still going to have an actuary that'll determine an ADEC figure based on those plan participants, and if you shortchange that ADEC, you're going to short you're going to create an unfunded liability. And I would uh, speculate that that's probably what happened in Michigan. If, if though, uh, they had met investment targets and uh, the legislature had continued to fully fund their uh, annual contributions as determined by the actuary, there's no reason that that plan should have been underfunded at all. Well, but see, there's the big question. If we meet our performance, investment performance, and if our actuary numbers are correct, but that's always the challenge. And, and as you have fewer and fewer active employees in your plan, um, some of those numbers, it gets a little more dangerous, doesn't it? No, I'd, I'd uh, exactly respectfully take the opposite view that as uh, the participants in that defined benefit plan shrink and the, as a pool, the average age is, is uh, uh, higher, uh, the actuary's job becomes easier. But, but, but we all know uh, that uh, the, an actuary's job is, is probably more different, uh, difficult than a, a rocket scientist. I mean, they, it, it's uh, extremely tough to make those estimates, and, and they're, they're going to be wrong sometimes. And, uh, but that's okay. Uh, the, the next set of calculations would uh, include any uh, mistakes that were made, so that you make up for it the, in the next uh, 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 annual contribution or, or uh, subpar investment performance. That's the actuary's job. It's a, it's a revolving uh, annual calculation that's done that takes all of that into consideration. Well, thank you. And I would urge members to uh, read the document that I sent them on the experience West Virginia, Alaska, and Michigan had with moving from a D plan, DB plan to a DC plan. Um, I, I think the results um, are, are starkly different than what's been represented today. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you, Representative Gannon, for your question. All right. Um, thank you so much, um, Samantha, for, uh, for preparing the, the proposal that you've put on the table and Bill for uh, the time and thought that you put into it and bringing it to us. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. All right, um, next up we have um, representatives Tina and Howard who are um, bringing a proposal that I believe is, uh, has been developed by the Working Vermonters Caucus. And so welcome Mary and Brian, and um, thank you so much for your flexibility and coming a few minutes early because we were a little bit ahead of time. So take it away. Thanks. Um, do I have the power to share the screen right now? We all draw a document, your document on our secondary device. So if what you were planning to show us is the document that you sent as a final draft, we can all pull that up on our secondary devices. Okay. 
Um, I, that's fine. I thought, um, you know, for members of the public watching, they could follow along, but maybe what I'll just say is if people who are watching on YouTube want to follow along, if you go to the um, government operations page of the legislature, I believe it's under my name, you can find the proposal that we're about to review for you. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we're here today, um, myself and Representative Howard are here to present to you a proposal that's been developed um, within the Working Vermonters Caucus. Um, and um, um, Representative Howard, before we begin, I just wanna say a little bit about our process. So the committee under, um, for those who may not know on the committee, how we developed this proposal. That yes. um, what we did was after, um, you know, the, uh, a, set of members from the caucus sent a letter to leadership about this issue several weeks back. And then there was an amendment that came from several members of the caucus and we heard some feedback about, um, about how we were presenting and developing ideas. And so we heard that feedback and we tried in the development of this proposal to take into account the feedback of our colleagues so from the beginning of this proposal, we've, in, we've made sure that House leadership and the leadership of this committee was informed of every single draft of this proposal as it was um, being crafted. And um, we polled our own members to begin the proposal, then created a Google Doc that members were able to comment on and chime in on. And then um, last night we had a meeting where we went through each section of the proposal and took a vote. Um, and there were three sections of the proposal that had very strong support and one section that had weaker support. And so I'll, we'll make sure we share that as we go through it. And at the end of the meeting, we, we took a vote and then we said, is anyone opposed? And no one said they were opposed to this. And then we offered members a chance to put their name on it. So there's people who helped shape this proposal, but who ultimately didn't put their name on it. So I just share that because um, the names on it don't reflect all, all of the voices that went into the crafting of this proposal, but they're the people who ultimately felt comfortable taking some ownership and putting their name on it. So that being said, um, we were trying at every step of the way to incorporate as many voices, not only of legislators, but also of union members and workers advocates as possible. Um, so that being said, let's begin. So um, Representative Howard, I believe I'm gonna do the first section. You're gonna do number two and three, and then I'm gonna do four. Does that sound right? I think you said yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, just, just better to be sure before we begin. Um, so now uh, I will look at my version of this. Um, so, um, so the proposal starts with a retirement fund task force. And you know we're not fixated on the name. So if you had a different name that, of the task force, it's fine. But the concept is that instead of, um, it's generally the position of the Working Vermonters Caucus um, there's strong agreement that instead of moving forward with a plan that changes things immediately, that we should create a task force. Um, and this doesn't undermine, this doesn't um, take away from the urgency of the issue. We're just saying we don't, the body shouldn't act on a plan immediately, that we should create a task force. And over the rest of 2021, hold more public hearings and meetings, um, mostly over the summer. And for this task force to come back to the legislature with a proposal in October of 2021 for legislative action in the beginning of 2022. So the thought is that if House GovOps and Senate GovOps got a report in October, even if we're not regularly meeting, the committee would have time to either have meetings or to review the proposal so that you could recommend action to the entire body right at the beginning of 2022, get this over to the Senate so that you can move on to the important work you have to do with reapportionment, um, which we are sensitive to. So we would ask you know, that, that we're not asking for a major delay um, and we're, we're acknowledging the timeline that you're on to finish all your important work this biennium. Um, in terms of the membership of the task force, we are providing you with a long list and decided that the committee could look at this list and decide ultimately who are the best people on the task force. Our recommendation though was the more the merrier that this process should include as many people as possible. And um, we ask that, it, that the membership is divided equally 
between workers, you know, or unions who represent the workers, the management and state officials um, to make sure that um, there's sort of equal voice between the different stakeholder groups. Um, and these members could include or should include, I don't know if I'll say shall, they may include um, VSEA, NEA, um, the VTA, the Professional Firefighters of Vermont, AFL-CIO, AFSCME, IBEW Local 300, who, who covers some uh, electric department workers, uh, the treasurer or their appointee um, or rep their representatives. Um, it was suggested that all members of both House and GovOps be, be on this task force, which is a, a lot of people, but that was suggested. So we incorporated that suggestion um, that the governor have representation and the judiciary, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the Vermont School Board Association, VPIC, and that they work with the actuary. So whoever the actuary is that works with the on this, that they'd be working closely with the task force during this time to help them make their decisions. Um, and I will review the powers and duties now, um, that they would evaluate the current VPIC model and if this is the best practice or what changes need to be made to pensions. They would evaluate the governance model in general. They would evaluate the structure of current plans and ways to improve performance. They would evaluate the management of the pension funds. They would explore the long-term viability of the pension funds. They would identify and advise on long-term possibilities for dedicated funding streams. They would review short-term possible revenue streams to pay off debt liability and set us up for success. They would consider the impact of retirement benefits on workforce development, including recruitment and retention. They would assess the impact of pensions on the other areas of the state budget and the state's economy as a whole. And the last part is really a vision thing, which is exploring the long-term transition to a public retirement system so that all workers can buy into pension plans someday. Um, with the idea being that if we can stabilize these pension funds and be strategic, we may be able to create a way to work towards a public retirement system that could benefit all workers who choose to participate um, in that system. And we include a resource to some ideas around um, ways to invest um, that are labor friendly. That's what this www.bankoflabor.com link is if people click on it. So this section of the proposal had extremely strong support. It was hard to take a vote count because there were people who were not voting on anything. There were people who don't always come who showed up. So we, it was more of like a straw poll, um, but this had a very strong support from people in the meeting. Um, so I'll, I'm going to hand the next section over to uh, Representative Howard to present to you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, we um, considered an, an independent evaluation of the um, pension funds performance and performance and management using an expert analyst uh, contacted through the auditor's office. Uh, the evaluation will identify reasons for the uh, fund's performance and independently ascertain and certify the performance valuation and um, um, le less of um, alternative investment managers like private equity, real estate, hedge funds, and commodities going back to um, 2011 with a specific emphasis on the last five years, given the charges identify alternate and potential investment strategies to improve or stabilize performance and to consider pro-labor investments. Um, and this report would be due in October, 2021. Transparency is very important. Um, an act of le a legislation su such as California and other states have done regarding annual disclosures of the fees and expenses the public investment fund pays to alternative um, investment uh, vehicle fund um, manager related parties, uh, the gross and net rate of return of each alternative investment 
<clears throat> by a certified public accountant who has been able to review um, violation and, and cash flow uh, reports of the underlying fund. And we have also put in, uh, included a, um, a link for uh, model legislation. I apologize for my um, <laughs> uh, nervous testimony. I am um, awaiting my daughter is coming home. I haven't seen her in over a year. So I'm just really excited. So please forgive me, but, um, uh, and thank you for listening. Um, if we need to raise extra money after the COVID money is gone, we consider, can consider a surcharge on high income earners for a set amount of time to recapture a portion of the 2017 tax cuts to raise extra revenue to help us meet our obligations instead of pulling it all on the backs of workers. Some preliminary numbers from JFO on the fiscal impact of a surcharge on income tax should be considered. And there are examples. 1.5% uh, on incomes over 300,000 would equal 30 to 40 million per year. 3% on incomes over 300,000 would equal 60 to 70 million per year. 3% on income above 500,000 would equal 40 to 50 million per year. 6% on income above 500,000 would equal 70 to 90 million per year. Additionally, in recognition of the importance of addressing long-term liabilities, this proposal calls for the state to dedicate a total of at least $150 million as currently appropriated above the ADEC amounts for paying down the state's four major retirement liabilities. And then below we have a listing of um, <coughs> the members who have um, supported this, um, uh, this uh, res uh, draft. And um, we um, are grateful for the time that you're taking to, to listen to us. And um, we um, look forward to working together to resolve this, this issue. Thanks, Representative thank Howard. Um, <laughs> thank you, Representative Howard. And, and just, um, I, I appreciate you doing the testimony, um, being so excited, and it's understandable why, why, why it's hard to focus um, when you're gonna see her, that's so exciting. So um, what I, I just wanna go back and report that for section two, the audit, there was very strong support for the idea of doing an audit. For section three, transparency, there was very strong support. Section four is the area where there was weaker support. There was still strong support, but there was weaker support. And I just wanna honor the views of those who question this section because um, asking for, for any additional tax on people, you know, is it's a big ask um, for, um, for us to make. Some of us believe that the people in these income brackets have benefited tremendously um, from tax cuts and increased wages over the last few years and that asking them to pay a little bit of that back to help the state out when we need them. Some of us believe that's the way to go and others are concerned about the impact of a surcharge. Some are concerned that it might lead to tax flight, you know, people leaving. Some are concerned that um, it might hurt the economy. So we honor those concerns. However, the majority of people did want this piece in there. And we hope that this can be something that is considered and that this may fall more into another committee's jurisdiction that maybe ways and means should you know, look more into this section um, as well. But I just wanted to honor that so that we are, you know, honestly representing the discussion from within our caucus. But ultimately, um, no one opposed us bringing this forward. And as you can see, we have a mix of senators and representatives as well as um, three different unions 
um, who were able to sign on and one political organization. And I, I should say that the VSEA could not sign on because they have a process they need to use that they couldn't use quick enough, um, but they have their own proposal that is similar. Um, so that being said, Representative Howard, if there's nothing that you think we missed, I think maybe we could take questions. Uh, no, I don't think that uh, there is anything, not from what I can see, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think we covered the overview and, and you know the gist of it is, I guess my closing comment would just be that we recognize that there is not one solution here. We have to look at this holistically. We have to look at what we've been doing and what works or doesn't work about it. We have to consider what, the, what would be the best practices moving forward and make a plan that's solid. We have to do this in collaboration with the workers and not impose something on them. And we need to be open to creative solutions, to catching up on our debt um, and look at the past and look at what has worked in the past. And the surcharge has worked at one point in Vermont history in helping us catch up. So we hope that that could still be considered. So in general, we ask that the committee you know, look at our different ideas and um, perhaps take more testimony on the, uh, these ideas because they do need more work. This is a proposal, not a bill, not an amendment. So the idea is, you know, we're, we're sort of tossing some cards on the table for you to, to incorporate into your game. So thank you. Um, I see a hand, so I'll stop there. Thank you representatives for the time and attention that you put into bringing this proposal before us. I really appreciate your engagement in this. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thanks to our fellow House members here. And, and uh, um, member from Rutland, I certainly get your excitement. I'm going to be able to babysit my two-year-old granddaughter for the first time since the summer. And uh, we've got lots of mud here, which she loves. <laughs> so I hope you, you enjoy your day, too. Um, I, I take note of the, the, your idea of raising revenues, and, and, and I realize I'm in a position that many people, few people are. Uh, I, I'm in a town where uh, I could go to my town and, and, and make that case. Uh, I live in a town where when Governor Dean came to our town meeting and was asked to raise taxes for schools, and he said, no, I'm not going to raise taxes, he got booed. There aren't many towns like that in Vermont, though. So my concern is, um, when you did you talk to the administration about your plan for for raising revenues and what kind of realistic chance that had? Uh, we have not spoken with the administration yet. I'm more than happy to sit down with them if they if they would like to meet with the Working Vermonters Caucus. Um, that would be great, actually. Um, so. You know, the pro the it sounds like where we're at now is we're in a we're in a deliberative process and now is the time so um i you know i would be happy to, for us to meet with them or for you as our government operations committee to you know um in your negotiations and talks with them or house leadership to to perhaps share some of this information um and one thing i would say is i don't want to raise taxes on all people. That's not what this isn't about. This isn't about like trying to tax people more. It's asking a very small portion of the population who has benefited immensely during a time of economic crisis to give a little bit back to help everybody else out of this um, of this hole that we're finding ourselves in. And I do think that's different than just saying let's raise property taxes on everyone or let's raise income taxes on everyone. So I think it's a. I think it'd be good for us to have that discussion with the governor, and I would hope that he he'd look back at what Richard Snelling did and what what happened back in 1991 as an example of how partnership between parties and between the bodies and you know pieces of government could lead to um, a you know a solution. Well, thank you. Um, I get that part, and I again uh, I agree that. There have been people that have uh, made out much better than the others. And at some point, I hope, starting on the national level, that we, we, we look at that. Um, our, our reality here, though, is we just had an election, and, and the person who said no taxes won by 65% against the guy who said he would pass a wealth tax. So uh, I think what we need to do is get real and, and find where the 100 votes we would need to pass this. 
and, uh, and, and if we can put that on the table, then it gets to be a serious proposal. But I thank you for bringing that in and uh, appreciate your time with questions. Tanya Vyhovsky. Excuse me, I would just like to add that we are in communication with the speaker's office. Yeah, we are. I think the governor, the governor we haven't been speaking with. So, I, you know, I'll, maybe we could take the feedback and maybe we could be proactive and reach out. So. Go ahead, Tanya. Thank you, Madam Chair. As someone who was part of, of working on this plan, I do just want to be clear and make sure that I am clear with the plan coming forward that the piece about offering a potential surcharge on the highest income earners is simply a piece on the table. It's not part of the proposal as like, we definitely have to do this, simply an option if we find ourselves in need of additional revenue. Yes, thanks, Representative Vyhovsky. I think what we are saying is that the state needs to follow through on the commitment to invest 150 million like we've already appropriated, but that we'd like other revenue to be considered you know, after that, like, and maybe, for example, if we determine that a, another 150 million would position us better, and then maybe over the next two years, there would be a surcharge. Um, but I will say that it's the strong opinion of the caucus that putting more money into the system isn't good enough. We have to look at what we're doing with that money. And that is a very important part of this proposal. And I want to highlight that because I think the tax piece can distract people. But really, what's up front here is we want a task force to sit down and do some more deliberative work to come forward with a plan to make sure that we're doing the best possible thing with the money, so. Sam LaFave. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both for being here today. Um, I have two questions. So one, um, I know that it was also part of our proposal for a, a little bit um, like the committee coming out, people have been asking for that. Did you guys have the opportunity to see how much this task force would cost from your proposal? No, we we um, don't have a, you know, the way it works is you, you can't get a fiscal note unless it's coming from the committee. That's what I was told. Like they can't, even for my amendment, I couldn't get a fiscal note unless you had voted yes on it. So, you know, we could sit down and try to calculate like if, if, if it was, if it, it honestly, the best thing would be if you wanted to move forward with the task force, you would say to JFO, how much does this cost? And they would just tell you, you know, I think that's honestly the easiest thing to do because me and, and Representative Howard could sit down if you wanted us to and try to calculate the per diems and, but you're GovOps, you, you, this is what you do. You make commissions and boards. And so you know that better than us. So um, I would suggest if you're interested in the task force, um, that you look at the cost of having the maximum amount of people and then decide, is that too expensive or not? And if it is, trim back. But a lot of the people involved are people who it's part of their job already. So um, they may not get the per diem. But yes, there would be, I wanna honor that there would be a cost. There would be. I see it though as an investment because investing some money in this task force, if they come forward with a better plan could save the state hundreds of millions, if not over a billion dollars or whatever, over 30 years, so. Yes, thank you. And I do appreciate um, you listed off a very robust amount of people that came to the meeting. I didn't know if someone just threw out there like while we're looking at this, um, um, I understand that that is in our wheelhouse and I appreciate appreciate um, the process of getting there. My second question is, is when um, this came out a couple of times. And so I just would just like to ask and have it out there. So we're saying that we are asking the high income earners to pay more. Um, would they really have an option to say no though? Because as uh, Representative Maruki said, his town, they, they, they're they fine with paying more. Would there be an option if the high earners wanted to pay and they could, but those that did not want to, did not have to, if we're asking. That's an interesting thought. Um, you know, I think when we say we're asking, we're acknowledging that in the political process in order to, for this body to have the political will to take this action, there would need to be some sense that there's support like other members have mentioned today so far. Like, and, you know, and, like the governor won by 65%, I think I heard someone say. One could question what that was really about. There's a lot of factors involved. I think changing leadership during a pandemic of somebody who was doing a, a fairly decent job during the pandemic, I would see that as probably the main thing. Um, but 
we're not here to talk about that. Ultimately, we're, what, the point of bringing that up, I thought, was to make the point that how do people feel out in the community? What do people want us to do? And I think if we took time over the summer with this task force, part of it could be public hearings on revenue. Part of it could be you know, inviting people to come out and speak to how they would feel about the surcharge and doing some outreach to the highest income earners and asking them if they would come out and testify how they feel. And perhaps, you know, taking a poll, we could do something like with the Social Equity Caucus do it didn't have a, a statewide poll that we run and gather information on. You know, there's all different kinds of ways to assess people's willingness, but ultimately we could also look at a way for people to opt in or opt out. Uh, that could be an option. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I guess what I'm saying is uh, when we say we ask, we're acknowledging that we, we have the right to impose things on people, but we also want to honor like that it's, if we engage in partnership with people that their people may consent to it. They may say, you know what, I, I'll give back 15 grand for the next two years out of the 60 grand that I'm sa already saving in my tax cuts if it means that my state is gonna be on solid footing for the next 30 years. Like I, I tend to think that most people would give a little bit more of what they're giving if they knew they were getting. I can say for myself that if, if my taxes went up to give me universal health care, and I didn't have to pay 500 a month for health care I can't afford to use, I'd be thrilled. You know, so there's like, you know, it's, it's sort of like, what are you getting for the money you put in? Um, and if, if we had a solid plan that we were going to invest this increased revenue um, into something that's going to save our state and help us out, people might be into it. So, John Gannon. Thank you. And I appreciate Thank you. Thanks. Representative Howard, did you want to Thank say you, anything that? Oh, I think you said it. Okay. Adequately, um, I have talked to a number of, of um, residents in my community and wealthy residents, and they have said to me, I would be willing to contribute more, such as for education, for these various um, opportunities. So um, I think we would be surprised at the number of people that would be willing to contribute to um, and, you know, to help our state. All right, we are closing in on three minutes to be respectful of the 30 minute time block. So John Gannon, jump right in. All right, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Brian Mary, for bringing this forward. And Brian, also thank you for inviting me to the Workers Caucus and letting me listen to some of your deliberations. That was great. Um, just, just a question about the, the task force itself. I, um, I did a quick count and I count 30 members. That's a large group to reach a decision about something as complex as pensions and OPEP. Um, any thoughts about how to control that? Because I'll tell you, I was part of the last retirement task force um, and it wasn't this large yet, you know, people threw out a lot of ideas and you know, it closed down because of the pandemic, but it really closed down because no one was willing to take responsibility to actually get. You, you um, froze a little bit for me. I don't know about others. Um, and, and it sounded like, like a robot, but I, I got the gist of it, which I think was that even with a smaller group, it was challenging to find consensus and to make decisions. And so we, were, we figured we would give you a list of, uh, we, instead of us trying to, to I think winnow is the word, right? Instead of us trying to kind of narrow it down, we figured we'd give you um, a list and you could decide out of that list how to, how to shrink it down. So I would actually defer, I don't, I don't know what you think Representative Howard, but I would defer to GovOps to maybe, if you were gonna consider a task force, I would ask you to take testimony from stakeholders about who they think really needs to be on that task force. And then you could make the, you could do the deliberation needed to make that decision. I felt like in a week, you know, speaking of process in a week, the that our caucus, the Working Vermonters Caucus, um, we weren't in a place where we were we could do that in a way that felt responsible. So we thought, let's hand it over to you. Let's give you, you know, we're handing you something where it's at, where it was at. We're happy to do more work on it if you want us to, um, but it really is your duty, and we, you know, we're bringing this to you. 
Um, but I, my suggestion would be you take testimony to make that decision so that it's the best possible decision. Thank you. Representative Howard, I wanna make sure you get chances to answer these questions too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I, um, you know, I agree with what, what Brian has said. We just wanted to give you a broad base of, of thoughts from um, the members of the caucus and um, rely on your expertise to, um, if you decide to put together a, um, a group, um, a task force, that you would um, be um, more in tune with who should be on that, um, that, that task force. I also would like to say that um, leadership means doing things that are not popular, but necessary. Um, Governor Scott can lead like um, Governor Snelling, and he can convince Vermont that this is a good idea, whichever idea we come up with. Um, we certainly would um, need his support. We certainly need to have him involved in our conversations. And um, I just wanna say thank you very much for your time. And I appreciate um, your having um, to take the time to listen to our proposal. Thank you. Thank you both so much uh, for the time and care. And I appreciate that you uh, also helped us to understand the dynamics within the Workers' Caucus um, that, uh, that, that you experienced as you were grappling with these ideas. So thank you for coming in this morning and you've given us some uh, important things to think about. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, uh, committee, we have um, one last idea proposal to put on the table. I, uh, I think I heard it characterized as the three amigos. So, um, uh, and it is within our own committee. So um, you, <laughs> I will apologize in advance that I have to scoot to run a meeting that starts at noon, but I will be here for the next eight minutes. So hopefully I'll get a chance to get a flavor of what you're presenting. Take it away. Muted in video. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Bob or Tanya, go for yeah. it. Well, Three Amigos, that was an interesting uh, introduction. And unfortunately, as I said to Rob, I don't have my sombrero with me, but I don't think that's the appropriate hat anyway for this discussion. I think we're going to require a little magic. So I have a, I have a tambourine for background. Uh, Ringo Starr, that's just what we need. Um, I uh, have the proposal is is was emailed to you and it's also on the the page. I don't think we need to go through every point, uh, but I'll say this about it. Um, it it's basically the same theory that you have heard from several proposals so far: cooperation rather than imposition. Um, it's it does not necessarily dictate anything other than the release of the $150 million and it suggests a concrete way to distribute that. Uh, it recognizes that we're gonna try to keep a promise, uh, but in the long term, the state of Vermont is not going away and we have the time to change course. Um, as an introductory sort of piece, Tanya and Peter both have strong feelings about certain sections of this um, I'll invite Tanya to speak to her preferences and then Peter. Um, so I, my preferences are not going to be a surprise to anyone. I really feel strongly that we need a dedicated task force that brings all the voices to the table to explore all the possible options in an equitable way that shares the the changes and and really this uh, this I think comes from my experience as a social worker and really is an augmentation to what the workers caucus brought us in that we can make difficult choices together and and when we're all part of making that plan it's a whole lot easier to move forward and not feel betrayed and left behind so I feel strongly that we're putting forth some options 
Um, but those options are to really be explored within a larger task force that brings every voice to the table to share the impact and to fully investigate the impact and not and and the multifaceted impact. As we've heard, some of these things can look great on the surface, but actually make it impossible to recruit new employees, which challenges our demographic problem and other impacts may be that people draw on more state benefits, which actually means the taxpayer is paying more just in a different place. So I think we need a really broad spectrum understanding of all of these different aspects that this proposal is going to put out <coughs> as possibility, possibilities for paths forward in that larger summer task force. So that's really where I felt strongly, like I said, not a surprise to anyone here. And Peter? Thank okay, you. thanks very much, uh, Tonya and Bob and uh, Madam Chair. I'm uh, willing to take ownership of a couple of particular things that I really see as a good faith effort to uh, meet the treasurer halfway, uh, the speaker part way, and uh, get something other than simply committing $150 million, which is to say, I'm willing to talk about COLA revisions. I want it progressive. You'll see the proposal essentially incorporates I want to talk about VPIC and its success and its shortcomings and its ability to monitor and inform, most importantly, inform the legislature as to how it's doing. I am optimistic that the next uh, actuarial valuation will see our ADEC go down. Uh, on top of that, I think it would go down if we, in, again, incorporated some specific limitations. I'm looking forward to uh, saying that we would not implement anything that affected anybody within 10 years of formal retirement or inactive status. Uh, uh, the other piece that I'm willing to sign on to right now is averaging salaries over four years, uh, final salaries over four years. That's in the plan. Uh, but I really do think the uh, kind of intra-group um, how shall I say, sharing responsibilities and evaluating cost versus benefits is something, as Tanya and Bob have said, that we can't do on the fly. I, but I repeat, I wanted to make a good faith effort to have something on the benefits side to show for the good faith of um, um, the uh, treasurer and uh, the speaker and try to move this along with some concrete change in what the actuarials will use to make the next estimate and tell us what ADEC looks like for the following year, which I think will be better. So thank you very much for considering that. So, you know, I think that highlight wise, aside from the money, you'll notice that we've carved out uh, the, the people that are really different than the regular workforce, the judicial system as Pat brought forward and the uh, law enforcement people that are uh, just not fitting into the mold very well because of either late hire or early retire. And there is a couple of, there are a couple of changes in those groups that you'll see as you read down through. Um, there's a rate increase there. We, we tried to put in something for everybody to either love or hate. Uh, and Peter mentioned it's a plan, but I would characterize it differently. It's quite frankly, a mandatory subject for bargaining, if you wanna say, that the committee is gonna to have to grasp and deal with and at least give consideration to um, something like what a, what a uh, contribution increase is gonna look at. You know that I've asked repeatedly for an attribution number from Beth to say which of the plans are actually charging us more in terms of unfunded liability everybody gets a base contribution increase and then there's consideration of uh, plans that are dipping into the well a little bit too much, making up something. New hires in this system, everybody goes to the same thing that the teachers are at. Uh, the rule of 90, uh, that exempts, of course, the judges and uh, the cops and law enforcement. Um, other forms of compensation like Sam and Mark and other people have brought up should at least be examined in this scenario so that we know that we're making a, a, a wide ranging and valid decision. When we talk about COLA for the existing workforce, uh, we look to equity here, but we did not look to be exclusionary. Uh, full COLA for anybody making a, not making, having earned 
a pension of under $25,000, and then half COLA for the additional 15,000 up to 40. Um, that, that really brings in a lot of the mid-range people so that they're not stagnant. Uh, the AFC, as people, Peter mentioned, is 48 months, four years. It's your last four years. That should, in theory, be your highest four years. If it's not, that means you whack the overtime uh, cow a little bit too hard, and that should probably be excluded anyway. Um, so there is spiking in the system. There are some means to prevent it in place now. Those should be generalized to all plans because, quite frankly, uh, they looked at Plan C with the state police originally. Uh, there's a lot of that going on in every segment of government now, both because of staffing levels and because of COVID response. Um, number six uh, gets to committee composition. This is, a, a, as Brian just said, this is essentially our responsibility. So it would be the burden on our committee to sit and listen and basically perform the duties of government here. But we bring in people from appropriations and ways and means so that they might help with funding and other subjects that we might broach into. Uh, there's an equal representation from the affected groups. The treasurer comes in as a member, but also brings the actuary in because they have a contract and that saves us money to some degree. Um, and, you know, number seven, Tanya's issue, my issue, Peter's issue, um, there's an opportunity here for people to walk up to the Salvation Army bucket and throw something in. Uh, there's also an opportunity for us to say, there's the bucket, go put something in. Um, there's there's the, the thing in the back of the room that we are not looking at, we've talked around a lot, but Beth brought in a number the other day that there are 81 people, I think she said, that have applied for retirement, actually filed the papers. I have been tempted repeatedly to send you all the four pages worth of people that I have had communication with that are trying to do that. Um, my last communication with somebody was that the retirement office is no longer taking calls. You either email them or you don't talk to them and it takes a while for them to get back. So that's a system that is not working. Um, so we need, to, we need to at least have a conversation about what the impact of these proposed changes. And when we talk about that, we're talking about the proposal that is on the table now uh, as the reference point, that might not be the one that goes forward. Uh, who knows, but it's a decision of our committee to make in consultation with others. Um, the, the governance piece is important, I think, to everybody. We heard some very strong evidence from a nationally recognized individual yes, yesterday, COVID time, who knows, that said VPIC at this point is actually operating under the best practice that he knows of. Um, there's a lot of allegation floating around about this, that, or the other thing. That's something that could be explored in this committee. And as far as this point number nine is concerned, it would be. Um, I think we have a general agreement that adding two people with a high level of financial expertise in institutional investment is not a bad idea. One from the governor's side, one from the member's side, how it gets divided is kind of up for uh, decision by the committee. Um, and quite frankly, these are recommendations, as I said, the committee takes all these things, they're mandatory subjects for discussion. They know they will know that there are gonna be a lot of pieces of the puzzle that'll be floating around. And we have to recognize in this document that the, the members of the committee are gonna have the power to shuffle things around, consider some, bump some out, and eventually make a recommendation that we have the ability to say yes to and get on the table for introduction at the beginning of the next session as the first item of business for this body. Um, we, we welcome you all to add your names to the three that are on the bottom of this list. And we'll take questions. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. And, and, and by the way, I have a copy of the movie, The Three Amigos, which I'm happy to lend to anyone who has a VHS player. I'm filling the role of Chevy Chase. <clears throat> um, all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the chair's guidance to me was that we could discuss this at, at a later committee meeting. Um, but Rob, you have your hand up, so why don't we start with you?
Well, I do. I got two questions. So, Peter, is that in black and white? Uh, yeah. um, no, mostly brown. Hollywood color. <laughs> um, I, I do have a question, though, and I don't know. And you got sombreros to boot. <laughs> um, I I don't know which one of the three of you that this would apply to, but I, I've heard the comment made a couple times that people in these pensions either do or could qualify for some form of public assistance. Are you able to quantify that number? Do we actually have people who are getting a full pension that qualify for public assistance? Sure. I have asked um, multiple people for that information and been told that we don't have it. Like we just, it hasn't been looked at, um, but I know that it has been brought up as a possibility as things shift and change. Um, and absolutely, if we freeze things at a certain level, as inflation happens, some, someone dips below the poverty level, they absolutely are going to start to qualify. And Beth brought it up as a possibility when the other day when she was talking about some of the pension changes. And I, I have asked for those numbers and, and have been told that they haven't been evaluated. So I also so, want them. So actually, it's more of a statement than that there's any facts that would prove it to be true. No, no it's an I assumption. I would disagree with that. I mean, in the past, we okay. have, in the past, we have, a, as a retirement board, and this is the distant past, have actually, the teacher's plan had a minimum payment involved in it. And we have upped that substantially over the course of several years because, quite frankly, the teachers were below the poverty level. And it sticks in my mind that probably 10 years ago, uh, and all things being equal, benefit level and salary, et cetera, uh, somebody did a run on how many people were involved with the Department of Social Welfare then and pensioners, and it was uh, embarrassing. And I, I don't think that we should shy away in this committee environment. It's an excellent question, Rob, to garnering that information once again and, and using it as a guide stick. But, but I know there are people that have, I know the guy that that used to work in Department of Social Welfare with me um, as the janitor. Fuel assistance, level of food stamps, um, you know, you just don't make that much money. And when you talk about half of that money, then you're- Okay, thank you. All right, so I am going to um, comply with the chair's um, suggestion that, that we um, adjourn for now and we can come back to this and the other um, proposals that we discussed this morning. And I want to thank everyone in the committee who presented an idea as well as the people um, like Representative Beck and Chena and Howard who presented ideas as well as the VSEA. Um, it was great to hear so many ideas this morning. So thank you all.